<laughs> now that's in my head. Bullet the blue sky. Uh, nerd alert. So how do you judge whiskey fairly? There's no such thing. <laughs> in the video. No, it's not actually true. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how I focus on it as a YouTuber because you've got a bunch of different categories of people in the world who are making judgments on whiskey. And I'm coming from the aspect of a third-party reviewer. And my customer is not the distillery. My customer, quote, or the people I'm trying to communicate with directly, are you guys watching the video and hoping to get some information about a whiskey. And so when I'm trying to do that, I judge it very specifically in kind of two categories, which is what is it that I think the maker was trying to accomplish and how close did they get to it? And uh, if you like certain things, like what can you expect from this whiskey just as a general consumer in the landscape of other whiskeys? And, and that's where I'm always trying to land. Every time I post something, anything, of any kind, doesn't matter, craft, big brand, whatever. There are at least a half dozen people in the comments who are like, nah, that's bull that whiskey's terrible, that's the crap, I can't believe it, it's not worth a penny, I'd rather drink garbage. I don't know how you drink garbage. Maybe that was just a euphemism. Um, but that's why one of my tenets is you gotta judge it in its category and by its intent. And so for example, you can't take like a $300 single malt and, and then, you know, a $20 blended scotch and be like, well, the single malt is obviously better. So I don't think that's a fair comparison for, for anybody, right? And sometimes I don't like something, but what they're trying to accomplish, they're hitting it out of the park. Uh, so I think like the Jack Daniels single malt that I did wasn't really my thing, but I think it was probably exactly what Jack Daniels was trying to do. And so I'm not going to critique it for being exactly what Jack Daniels tried to do, but I am going to say, if your preferences are these things, it's probably not going to be your thing. So, no, oh, this is a shiny. So I might say, okay, you really love big, bold Texas single malt flavors, but there's not one single style of Texas single malt. There's kind of a general direction you can kind of find, but I also know some people making softer and gentler and, and uh, closer to scotch kind of, but even in Balcones or even inside of Andalusia, you've got a range. I mean, you got Striker and Revenant, but you've also got the triple distilled, which is a much lighter, uh, but still a bigger flavor profile than what you might get from like, say, Glenfiddich. So when making objective judgments and reviewing a whiskey, those are two fair ways, but what is it about the competitions, which is a whole other thing, right? How do you judge those fairly? All right, let's talk about Bullet. Now, my understanding is that they didn't make this, that they uh, sourced this, or actually, I would say, contracted another company in Kentucky to make this, because the level of equipment change that it required to switch to making single malt or schedule change uh, would really screw up their production schedule for all the things that Bullet classically makes, the bourbon and the rye. And so they wanted to get into the single malt, so they contracted with another company for their specifications to make the single malt. And so I don't know who that is, and I'm not even gonna guess, because I don't actually care. Um, they were pretty transparent about the fact that they did it, and that's fine with me. This is New American Oak, which is what has been kind of the hallmark of all of these big bourbon brands getting into American single malt. Most of them are doing new oak, at least partially, if not the whole way through. Um, and remember that um, most of Kentucky distilleries, the big guys are doing, and I think this is one of them, a column still for the first distillation followed by a double order. And what that effectively turns into, it's not exactly the same, but what it effectively turns into is a column still for the stripping still to get the alcohol proof up there, followed by a double order, which is sort of like a pot still, and then you make cuts. Instead of still doing double pot still, it's column pot combo. And that's more in the direction of what happens when you get a doubler. It is very shiny and citrus forward. The, it's definitely barley and you have that sort of honey cream, but there's a little bit of lemon. And then it is a little more thin and brittle on the nose. But behind that, 
There's some soft, like super hard candy fruit notes. And then I would say almost floral, but not quite. It's pretty vanilla cream thin. Um, but it's just got a little bit more body than, say, a corn whiskey would have. Huh. Interesting. Really honey, soft creaminess, and then it gets a little bit sharp and shiny. Very gentle, not a struggle. Very soft. The shininess makes it almost brittle, but not so much that it's like, mm, ah, that's harsh. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of just like grain hard candy and honey and it's very simple. Not a lot of complexity, a lot of new American oak. Um, but hey, that's uh, again, again, I think this totally different than the Jack Daniels single malt but it falls in the same intentions category of, I think this is a gateway into American single malts in the sense that like, it's, you're not gonna have to deal with full, big, hefty American single malt flavors. It's gonna be more of like a hint of, let's show you a soft direction of barley. But honestly, that's kind of, for me, what Bullet does for their rye and their bourbon. They're sort of a soft, approachable, easy drinking, category in general. And so I think as far as for distillery character, this probably falls right on the money of how they present their rye, how they present their bourbon, and now how they present their single malt. So incredible job at maintaining distillery character and mentality and approach. Not my preferred direction for American single malt, but I like those big bold her, you know? If I was, if I was told this was Scottish, I would not be surprised if it was a blended scotch, because the shininess of the column still definitely appears in the character of this whiskey. Um, it's kind of low, like just usual 45. So I'm gonna put a little water into this, not a ton. I really need to get the little giant little straw out to make this a little more scientific, but I keep forgetting, so. Okay. Man, is it hard to be a judge at a whiskey festival or a whiskey competition because you do, even as an educated palate, there's a lot going on. There's time of day, there's how many flights did you have, there's what categories did you have before or after, there's what order did you progress through your 11 flight in a category. Um, and this is why the best competitions have a lot of judges and not like three determining everything. Um, and they do it over time and they balance that and they wait and grade the evaluations because you really need that because people, even with great palates and a lot of training are still people and fallible and, and senses are still super subjective. So how do you, when you're submitting things, even know what to do? Well, I'll tell you uh, that once you get into the industry, you discover pretty quickly that distilleries, like when I was at Crowded Barrel, will submit to competitions spirits they think have a better shot at winning at that competition. And so you will tend to find, just go back and look at all the winners for ADI or American Craft Spirits Association or San Francisco or New York, and you will see trends of the kinds of things that get awards and the kinds of flavor profiles that they're looking for. I remember when the first time, uh, well not first time, but three or four years into the Texas Whiskey Festival, we had judges whose great love was Kentucky bourbon. And the winners that year all went down the hallmarks of things that Kentucky bourbon drinkers would really love. The year that um, Crowded Barrel won best grain to glass single malt in Texas, all the things that won that year were these really gentle, soft, uh, mild approaches to things in spite of the big, bold, holy crap, Texas things. And so this is a known thing in the industry that you watch what gets awards in different programs and you look at your profile of your spirits and you pick certain whiskeys to go to certain places based on what you think they can accomplish. And that's the smart way to do it. You should do that because as a creator at a distillery, 
what you're looking for from the judgment and is a gold medal <laughs> because you can put it on your bottle and on the counter and there is zero question it moves sales like crazy uh if you're not a wine drinker tell me you don't walk down the wine well going like, I don't even know what to bring to a party, and then look there and see a badge that says wine uh, advocate or wine spectator rated this one 98 out of 100, and you'd be like, that one's going to the party, right? That we are that way. In any categories we don't understand, you trust experts. And we should, we should trust experts, even though they're fallible, and even though sometimes it goes wrong and they get it wrong, because that's, that, that's how that world works. And if you care enough, then you learn about the category. So is there a point to winning awards? Yeah, absolutely, it blows up distilleries. And is there a point to it for consumers? Nah, if you're willing to spend the time to educate yourself to figure out what those judges award and you discover you can trust it, then sure, that becomes a trusted source. But I think as a consumer, an educated consumer, you're better off finding individuals who drink and review things learning their palates, and then trusting them. So I say you should be trusting the blogs and the YouTubes and the, the, uh, the Whiskey Wash. Um, but with places like Whiskey Wash, look at who's reviewing it. They got a lot of people reviewing things. And just like Rolling Stone, figure out who, you, who your reviewers are and who, who you have a similar palate to. And trust your friends. Drink more with your friends. And when your friend says, man, this is good, no that you're either going to be like, I got to try that, or like, oh, I'm not going to like that because I know what he likes. So it's hard, but it's worth doing, and it's worth exploring, and don't shy away from opinions because that's what makes things fun sometimes. I'm really glad you're here. Cheers. Cheers.